Good morning, church. Good morning, good morning, good morning. How's everybody? A little wet. <laughs> That's okay. Liquid sunshine, as they say, right? I uh, just want to go over a few uh, newer announcements. Um, last week, uh, we talked about um, the hub. Uh, Dawn talked about it. Uh, there's a slide going through the slideshow. Um, if anyone knows of anyone that needs prayer, physical encouragement, transportation, meals, any kind of need at all, you can call that number. You can call or text. Uh, that number is 443-205-2036, and that'll start the chain of getting those things taken care of. Also, a big shout-out to those that... Um, volunteered Friday at the football game at the concession stand. There are more dates coming up if you feel so inclined to come out and, and volunteer. September 23rd, October 7th, October 20th, and October 28th. And you can see Nathan to sign up for that um, in the concession stand. This week, Thursday evening, 6.30 in the Hope Center, we're going to do our second women's power surge. Um, it's a great evening of fellowship, encouragement, and um, Mickey just let me know we're going to start a study on the fruit of the Spirit. So any of you women that would love to come out, um, please do so 6.30 in the Hope Center. We're going to try to make that a monthly meeting, and hopefully we'll have a lot of uh, participation. Again, uh, just a reminder of the Board of Directors survey. Um, printed copies are in the hallway, and you can also fill that in online. That information to get back to our board of directors is very helpful. Um, and I don't, I didn't see Nathan today, but last week um, he only needed seven more people to commit to the um, bus trip, uh, tentative bus trip to the Museum of the Bible in D.C., um, September 17th, he told me, was the deadline to have all of those um, interested numbers in. Um, so that's coming up. Um, so hopefully we can get enough to secure the bus, and it'll be, he said, sometime in late October, early November. And the only day that uh, it can be done is on a Sunday, so just keep that in mind. Um, but let Nathan know if you are interested. And we continue with our 12-step anonymous meeting for addictions every Sunday evening at 6 in the Hope Center. And I did see a slide on if anyone is um, interested in getting baptized, please let Jason or someone know um, of that so we can get that uh, lined up for you. And again, it's been a busy week worldwide news. Today, of course, it's hard to believe, 21 years since... Um, 9-11, so keep all those families in your prayers. Thanks. How's everybody doing? Yeah. Doing great, good. On this rainy day. Um, Dawn mentioned the, the surveys and all that kind of stuff. Jimmy Adams showed me how to use these things last week. <laughs> and it is awesome like to be able to just, I guess you just use your camera right you open up your camera and put it on there and it takes you right to the site or whatever it was miraculous I'm telling you so um, take advantage of these I think there's some maybe in the hallway I know you can use these up here check out the hallway uh, there's like a communication board up there that has all kinds of stuff going on uh, sign up for a card the card ministry if you'd like to be someone who's on the list of people that will send out cards to people who who need it and that kind of stuff prayer ministry there's lots of things out there so even if you don't typically go that way kind of make your way out there and check it out i think dawn's going to put another kind of mini information board right out here in this this lobby for you or whatever um but check it out lots of opportunities to get involved and and do things and be a part of of what god's doing a lot of exciting things um, that I think God has already started and is planning to, to bring into, into our midst in the, in the coming weeks and months and all that kind of stuff. Be praying that, um, I don't want to be careful how I say this, uh, be careful uh, or pray that God would, would take out some of the hindrances and remove some of the obstacles uh, towards growth. How many people know that we're going to face opposition? Yeah. Right? Anytime we try to advance the kingdom, we're going to face opposition. And, and most of the time that comes in people form. 
right? And this is why I want to be careful in that because many times I'm the hindrance and I'm stum- the stumbling block. So um, to be praying that God will help us in areas that we need help to continue to move forward. Okay, we're trying to improve in lots of different areas. Communication is one of them. That's why the survey is so important and the, the things on the outside board are so important. We're trying to in- improve that. Uh, I'm thankful that God is bringing people into our congregation and raising them up that are good at those kinds of things. I mean, the electronic stuff is a great tool to be used for that. So um, God's brought people on our board and other people that are stepping up and getting involved that are good in those areas of communication. So we are trying to improve that. Um, I, I tend to be a hindrance in that area. So be, again, praying for me and praying for other, other areas where we may face opposition and moving forward in the direction that God wants us to go. Right? Because I believe he's, he's, he's called us to I want to be careful. I'll say this. He's, he's, he's called us to greatness. Right? I want to be careful again how I say that. But we are not supposed to live as individuals or the, the ministry, the body of Christ, these um, sort of mundane and unnoticed lives. Right? As, as individuals and as the body of Christ, people are supposed to take note of us. Right? They're supposed to be able to look at, wait, something different there. What's going on? What's happening? Right? And the enemy certainly doesn't want that to be the case. Um, you know, he would love for that, us to be recognized for all the wrong reasons, not all the right reasons. So, I don't know. That might not make any sense, but just been praying about that a lot this morning. Just, again, that, that God will continue to use us and that we would submit ourselves to him to be used by him. So, just be praying about all of that stuff. So, anyway, let's go ahead and, and, and pray. And we're going to jump back into the book of Romans this morning. This is a, a message that was two weeks in the making. You'll be pleased to know that I showed great restraint this week because I was determined not to go back and add a whole lot of stuff and change it up because with an extra week there's so many things I wanted to go back in and go oh I can expand on that and I can talk more about that and I was like don't do it relax so this is going to be a two week a two week kind of mini series within this massive series that we've been doing right um and I didn't combine them I was going to do it I thought about it I was like I'm going to put both of those weeks into one and we're not so be praying that God will help us to hear, because it's also going to be challenging. It's going to be a difficult message this morning for all of us, because um, how many of us deal with um, unforgiveness or um, holding on to offense or anything like that? Anybody here? Okay, a couple of people. <laughs> we'll meet in a room down the hall. All right. I think we all do. I really do, and I think as, as we go through this this morning, uh, I pray that God does open our eyes to see those areas where maybe we've done this, and maybe we just only realize that we've done it. Okay, that we've written people off or uh, maybe ignored people and, and haven't even known we've done it. So let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll jump into it. Father, I want to thank you for this morning, this, this, this beautiful morning. And I say beautiful because every morning that we wake up and have an opportunity to do your work, to have fellowship with you and fellowship with your people and to impact people who don't know you, it's a beautiful, beautiful day. So despite the weather, um, I'm, I'm looking forward to what you're going to do in and through us this morning. So we want to ask that you would just fall on us in a way that is palpable this morning. We know, Lord, that you came, came with us this morning in us. You reside in us as Christians. So this isn't a, um, an Old Testament kind of experience where you're, you weren't here and now we're asking you to show up. We know you showed up with us, but we just pray that, that we would be more aware of your presence in us and, and, and around us than maybe we, we are typically that we will be listening for your voice as you speak to us this morning as individuals. Um, I pray that we will allow our hearts to be um, convicted this morning, that we will allow our hearts to, to be, uh, the eyes of our heart to be open this morning, to see things that maybe we're not even aware of, to face some things that aren't pleasant to face, um, because I think it's so necessary. The, the calling that you have placed on each and every one of us as individuals and as a ministry is huge. To, to take the, the kingdom into a lost and broken world is a huge command and a, and a huge privilege that you have given us. So I just pray that this message will be used to, to help us in that, in that endeavor and in that, in carrying out this mission that you have given each and every one of us. So again, I pray that you will help me to speak with clarity this morning and that you will give each and every one of us ears to hear your voice as you speak through me to us this morning. So we ask all these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So uh, one thing I do want to mention, uh, Ken, Ken Plummer called me last night, and he was going to come. He wanted to share a couple words this morning. I'm be praying for him. I'm hoping maybe he didn't have any kind of setback or anything this morning. He was feeling pretty good last night, and he said, man, I really want to come to church. I'm excited to see everybody, and I want to come and, and give a, a brief word of testimony saying what God has been doing in me and tell people how thankful I am. So he wanted to do that this morning, and I, he hasn't shown up. He's not here, so I'm, I'm, again, I'm hoping that maybe it's 
just get moving, maneuvering in the rain can be difficult when you're limited in your mobility. So I'm hoping maybe it's something like that, but at least want to throw that out there. All right, so let's look at Romans chapter 9. And we're going to look at uh, verses 1 through 4 again. And if you're going, well, hold on, wait. Two weeks ago, we were in Romans chapter 9, verses 5 through something. You're going backwards. That's not a good thing for you. You need to keep moving forward. There was something in this passage when when I taught on it three weeks ago that just, I knew it wasn't finished. I knew there was something more, you know, and I couldn't put my finger exactly on it to figure out, okay, what is it? Lord, what am I missing? What is it that you still want me to talk about? And then last week, as I was preparing for this message, <clears throat> it really hit me, and I knew I had to go back and revisit this. Okay, so let's read it, and then we'll, then we'll kind of talk about it. All right, so we're verse 1. He says, I speak the truth in Christ. This is Paul, again. He says, I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. And then we looked at, at Romans chapter 10, verse 1, which tells us uh, maybe in an even more clear way what it is that Paul is struggling with. Why does he have this unceasing anguish? He says, Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. All right, so Paul <clears throat> has been talking through the first um, eight chapters of Romans just about um, the gospel and how marvelous it is and spectacular it is and just what good news it is that God, by his grace and his love for us, decides to save us to step into our situation, to step into our reality, and rescue us from our life of sin, right? Um, and it's not our, on our own merit. It's not because we deserve it. It's not because we're good people. We just, we can't earn it. And he gives us this, this precious gift of salvation, again, just out of his own grace and out of his own love. He's been talking about how spectacular that is, right? And then we looked at chapter 8, where he, he builds to talk about how spectacular this is and this future that we have to look forward to when he's done what he's doing, right? Because he's in process. He's renewing all things. And he talks about how spectacular this is going to be when we face this future where everything is renewed, right? Where we don't have this broken body anymore, where sin isn't present, where the world is transformed, and we have this new heaven and new earth, and everything is as God wants it to be, right? And how spectacular that is, right? And he says things in chapter 8, like there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? That those he called, he justified, those he justified, he, he glor- he's going to glorify. Like he gives us these it's just ridiculous promises, these spectacular promises of what he's doing in our midst, that he's working on our behalf, even when we don't see it. All of these wonderful things, right? And then he shifts gears when he gets to chapter 9. He's going to talk about something different, because as Paul has done throughout the book, he anticipates the questions. He knows there's going to be some resistance. He knows there's going to be some questions about the things that he's teaching. And this time, the question that he's going, going to address is what we talked about a couple weeks ago, is the, the Jews have to be hearing this, and they have to be going, hold on, wait, 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 wait. We've been promised so much of this stuff in the Old Testament, right? We're God's chosen people. And now, Paul, you're saying that this good news is for everyone and everyone's going to be saved. Well, what about us? Wait, I thought we had a special place in the kingdom. Like, what about us? So Paul begins to address that to be able to say, hey, listen, God has not forgot about you. He has not, he has not forgot about the promises that he's made to you. So he starts to talk about his faithfulness, God's faithfulness to, to the Israelites, to the Jewish people, right? So that's what, he, that's what he's kind of shifting gears to talk about. He's going to talk about... Talk about that from chapters 9 all the way to chapter 11. So we're going to be talking about this for several weeks, God's faithfulness to the Jews. And along the way, there's going to be things that I think we can learn from this, right? Because um, what I would have us do so often is first realize, again, the context, that that when when Paul is talking about Jews, he's actually talking about the Jewish people. But by extension, we can learn from that, right? Because the Jews were the chosen people of God, just like we as Christians are the chosen people of God. So there are things that we can learn about the Jewish history and God's promises to them. Does that make any sense? All right, so that's sort of where he's going in chapters 9 through 11. But he starts it off by just talking about his love and concern for the Jewish people, okay? And he says, man, my heart is breaking. That most, of, most of you guys have rejected Christ as the Messiah. You've rejected him as the Messiah. And, and, we, and we talked about this a couple weeks ago about we should have the same heart for the lost, right? That it should break our heart. We should have this unceasing anguish at the thought that there are people who are dying not knowing Jesus who are on their way to hell, right? That should be devastating to us, each and every one of us. Right? So we, we, we talked about that. Is that the case? Are you, are you devastated thinking about the people that you know in your life that don't know Jesus? Yeah. Right? That, that, should, that should just devastate us and break our hearts. Okay? So we talked about that, but again, there was something in that that I thought there's something beyond that that I need to talk about, and I, I'm not sure what it is. And, and then it hit me when I went back and reread what we just read again. Um, 
And it was, it, it was the word Israelites, where Paul says, man, my heart is breaking for my own people, the Jews. And it got me thinking about, okay, hold on, what, what was Paul's relationship to the Jews? How, you know, what was it? Did he have a great relationship with the Jews? Uh, and, and it led me to go back and start looking at, at the history and looking at what does the Bible say about Paul's interaction with the Jews. All right, so I'm going to do this, and I'm going to be a little bit over the top. And I, I know that's probably not shocking. You're like, that's what you do. Go, you know how to beat a dead horse. But we're going, I'm going to do that for a minute because I want us to see this. I want us, I want us to, to get a clear idea of Paul's interaction with the Jewish people because I think it becomes really, really important to what we're going to talk about this morning. All right, so let's look at Acts chapter 9, verses 28 through 29. So it says, so Saul, and this is Paul, okay? Paul's name was Saul before it got changed by the Lord. So Saul stayed with them, and he's talking about the, the people in Jerusalem, the Jews, stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. All right, so he's sharing the gospel in Jerusalem, where, where he's surrounded by all of these Jewish people. It says he talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews. The Hellenistic Jews were the ones who were Greek-speaking. Remember the... the Israel had been taken over by the Greeks and then by the Romans. So during the Greek occupation, many people began to take, adopt a lot of the, the Greek ways and start to speak Greek and those kinds of things. All right, so those are the Hellenistic Jews. He says he talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they what? Tried to kill him. Okay, so he's sharing this good news. He's trying to share salvation with them. And yet, what are they doing? How do they respond? They try to kill him. How many people have ever faced negativity when you're trying to share Christ with people? Anybody? Okay. A lot of us have experienced that, right? There's resistance. Sometimes it's, it's more of an indifference. Sometimes it's just blatant um, persecution for it, right? Where maybe people say, man, you're so stupid. You're foolish. How can you be so naive? Whatever, right? They actually try to kill him for sharing this. And, and we've talked about a lot of the reasons why. But let's flip over a couple more pages, Acts 13, 49 through 50. It says, the word of the Lord spread through the whole region. But the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. So Paul would travel from city to city to city to city, right? And he would share the good news. This is part of who Paul was. He was an evangelist. He wanted to share the good news with people about Jesus. So he's doing that. He's traveling from city to city. So he goes to this one city and begins to share the good news. And now these Jewish leaders begin to go to these people who were they weren't Christians at this point. They were called God-fearers. So people who would say, man, I, I believe that the God of the Bible is real. I, I, I want to put my faith in the God of the Bible, right? But they weren't, they weren't Jews, but they weren't Christians either. So these Jewish leaders go to them and says they began to incite the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. All right, so Paul goes in, he preaches the good news about this. A lot of the Jewish people don't like it. So even the people that are starting to listen to Paul and agree with Paul, they begin to go behind the scenes and kind of incite this, this negativity amongst them. So then they begin to turn on Paul and begin to persecute Paul, and they kick him out of the city. All right? Let's flip over another page, Acts 14. And we'll look at 1 through 7 and 19 through 20. It says, At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. Now, I love this, because what was Paul's routine? What did he do? He would go from city to city, and he would go into city, and the first thing he would do was find a, a synagogue. A synagogue was sort of like a church, at that point, for the Jews. And he would go in, he would begin to preach Jesus to the Jews in the synagogue. Now, I love this. He would go there first, all right? Even though he would get kicked out of this one city and another city and another city, he would still go back to the Jewish synagogue to preach the good news about Jesus to these people, right? So he went, as usual, into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke, they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the other Gentiles, and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to perform signs and wonders. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. And, and I love the wording of that, right? So there's two sides to pick. What were the two sides? The Jews and the apostles, okay? So they're, at op they're opposed to one another, okay? So get that, all right? So keep, we keep on reading, uh, verse 5. There was a plot afoot among both Gentiles and Jews together with their leaders to mistreat them and stone them. In case you don't know what stoning is, during this time, this was sort of a, the capital punishment of the day. Whenever someone was, was found guilty of a, of a crime that went against the commandments, so in most, not maybe not most, but in a lot of situations, stoning was the prescribed consequence. 
So we read about things like, like adultery, blasphemy, all these different sins, right? They would stone people. Stoning is just what it sounds like. They would take you to the outside of the city, the outskirts of the city, and they would pick up huge stones and rocks, and they would pelt you until you died, right? A lot of the situations, what they would do is they would bind you by, by your hands and your feet, and they would throw you off a small, like, like cliff, right? So you would fall down, bound, and then they would pelt you with stones until you died, okay? So this is the plan for Paul. Paul is there preaching good news, salvation. He's looking at his fellow Jews, and he's going, you need to hear this, right? You're not in relationship with the Lord, and I desperately want to see you in relationship with the Lord. So this is how you can be saved, right? Paul is showing this great compassion, this great love for his fellow people, and how do they respond? They're going to stone him. They're going to kill him, right? Uh, so verse 5, there was a plot of foot among both Gentiles and Jews together with the leaders to mistreat them and stone them, but they found out about it and fled to the Lyonian Ly- Ly- cities of Lystra and Derby, and to the surrounding country where they continued to preach the gospel. Okay, so I love the fact they continued to preach the gospel. They're not dissuaded from it. Okay, then we skip on down. So Paul and them leave that city and they go to another city. Right? It says, then some of the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. Okay, so the people in the city he just left hear that Paul and, his, and the other apostles are preaching the good news in another city. So what do they do? They travel to that city. Now remember, they're not jumping in the car. Right? They're not taking a bus. To travel to another city was, was a big undertaking. Right? you got to really want to do something to travel in this time. So they had such a desire to persecute Paul that they actually traveled to another city just to show up there to persecute them, right? So then some of them came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul, so now they're not just planning it, they actually do it. They take him outside the city and they stone him, right? And dragged him outside the city thinking he was dead. So they thought they murdered him, all right? But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and did what? went back into the city. The next day, he, he and Barnabas left for Derby. Right, so he gets stoned in this city, left for dead. He gets up, goes back into the city, and then decides to travel to another city. All right, let's go to Acts 18, 4 through 13. Are you picking up the pattern here? Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. Okay? But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Okay, so now, this is the first sign that we get from Paul that there's a little frustration with the Jews. Right? He's like, okay, listen, I, I, I got to take a step back. Right? It's, I've, I've told you the good news and you're not listening to me. Now, we're going to talk about this next week. And this is the part two. Right? Even when I started to prepare this message last week, I felt like, oh, there's more to be said here. Right? So next week, we're going to talk about how, how, what, do we, what do we do? How do we face this opposition? Today is more about motivation. Where's your heart? Where's your concern? Right? Next week, we're going to talk about the practical implications. How do we walk it out? Okay? So verse 7, then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the, the, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid, keep on speaking, do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one is going to attack you or attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. While Gallio uh, was pro- proconsul of Achaia, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him into the place of judgment. This man, they charged, is persuading the people to, to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Now, I love that. So Paul says, okay, look, I'm going to take a step back. I will then I will go talk to the Gentiles. If you don't want me to preach the good news to you, I'll preach it to somebody else. And what do they do? Continue to go after him. Okay, it's not like they go, okay, he's not talking to me anymore. Good, let him go. No, 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 no. They continue to persecute him. So the Jews are following him around basically everywhere he goes, trying to persecute him for preaching the good news, right? For trying to save them. Okay, keep on reading. Acts 21, flipping over a couple more pages here. It says, When the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd and seized him, shouting, Fellow Israelites, help us. This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people and our law in this place. And besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. They had previously seen uh, Trophimus, 
the Ephesian in the city with Paul and assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple. The whole city was aroused and the people came running from all directions. Seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple and immediately the gates were shut. While they were trying to kill him, or trying to kill him again, news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. When the rioters saw the commander and, and his soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. The commander came up and arrested him and ordered him to be um, bound with two chains. Then he asked who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd shouted one thing and some another. And since the commander could not get the truth because of the uproar, and I love that, he couldn't get to the truth, right? The, the people aren't even clear as to why they're, they're persecuting Paul. They're not even sure, sure exactly why they're beating him. They just know that he needs to be beat, okay? He ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. When Paul reached the steps, the violence of the mob was so great he had to be carried by the soldiers. The crowd that followed kept shouting, get rid of him. Okay, what do they mean by get rid of him? Are they saying get him out of the city? No, Acts 22, 21 through 22 lets us know exactly what they mean by get rid of him. It says, then the Lord said to me, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. The crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, rid the earth of him, he's not fit to live. All right, so this isn't the first time that we've heard a crowd yelling, kill him. Right? All right, Jesus goes through the same thing. For what? Coming to die for people. Right? Jesus comes to die for people, and what does he get in return? They kill him. Paul comes preaching the good news about how people can be saved. And what do they do? Try to kill him. Right? Now, this is the this is where I want to get to the point of how this impacts us. Okay, a couple weeks ago we talked about do we have a, a, this unceasing anguish for the lost? Do we have this desire to see the lost saved? I think that's, that's a, a powerful thing in, this, in these verses in, in Romans chapter 9, but I think it goes beyond that. Right? I think it's even, it's even more challenging than that. It's more difficult than that. When you start to look at the relationship between Paul and the Jews, these were people who hated him, who persecuted him, who tried to kill him, and yet... Paul has this burning desire to see them saved, right? If there was ever a group of people that Paul would have been like, I don't care what happens to you, it would have been the Jews, right? And yet, he wants to see them saved. So this is the question that I have for us this morning. Are there people that we have washed our hands of and said, I'm done with? I don't care what happens to them. I'm done with them. Anybody coming to mind? Anybody offended you? Anybody said something to you? Anybody persecuted you? Anybody mistreated you? That you've been like, I'm done with them. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe it's your neighbor. Is there anybody that has offended you where you said, I'm finished with them? Maybe it's a parent, right? Maybe you had a, a horrible childhood, and now you've got it as an adult where you've been like, I'm done with them. I think we look at Paul, and we would have said, man, Paul had every reason to do that, and yet he didn't. Why? Why didn't he do that? Why did Paul continue time and time and time again to go back to these people who kept rejecting him? Why did he go back to them and preach the good news about Jesus? I think we find out in 2 Corinthians 4, 15-18. Paul comes right out and says this, All this is for your benefit. Whose benefit? Their benefit. I love this. So Paul goes through all of this stuff, all of these beatings, all these stonings, all these exiles, all these things that Paul goes through. Surely somebody was looking at Paul going, Paul, Paul, why? Good grief, man. Why do you keep signing up for this abuse? He says, for them. Because I love them. I care about them. I can't stand the thought of them going to hell, even though they've done things to me that would cause me to want to say, I hope they get what they deserve. Right? He says, all this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. He's saying, man, I, I want to see people give, give God glory. I want to see people in relationship with the Lord. Right? He says, therefore, we do not lose heart. I love that. You ever just lose heart with people? You're just like, what's the point? It's never going to make it. They are never going to change. How many people have ever said that statement? They are never going to change. You look at other people and, and you're like, man, they've been doing the same thing for years. They're lazy, they're mean, they're inconsiderate, they're this, they're that, we fill in the blank. They're hopeless. Right? We've lost all hope for them. Paul says, man, we don't do that. Therefore, we do not lose hope. Though outwardly, we are wasting away. Yet inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And I love that. Where is his focus? On glory. 
on eternity, right? And we've talked about this, and today we're going to tie together several of the messages that we've had from the book of Romans in the past several weeks, right? We talked about this, that we need to have this eternal perspective, that that changes everything. How in the world do we deal with hard times and, and trouble and difficulties now in this life? By knowing it's coming to an end, right? And, and in eternity, we won't even remember it. It'll be a distant memory. We see that this is the only way that Paul is able to do this, right? In order to take this beating, to take this abuse time and time and time again, he knows that eternity is worth everything, right? It's everything, so Paul is looking, and how many people have gained this kind of perspective? Hopefully you have. There's been times in your life where you've got angry about something, where you've maybe you've had a disagreement with somebody or whatever, and it seemed like the biggest deal in the world, right? Just for later on, years down the road, you look back and you go, that was stupid. Who cares, right? That's just a little bit of perspective. Imagine if we had an eternal perspective. Do you think you're going to worry about a little offense that somebody committed against you 30,000 years from now? You think we're going to be dwelling on that, remembering that? You think it's going to matter? So we're going to hold that thing against somebody for all of eternity. That's going to have eternal con consequences. When we say, I'm not going to share the gospel with them. I don't care. They're hopeless. They're never going to change. We don't share it with them, knowing that that could end up with them in, the he in hell for all of eternity. Really, over that offense. Right? It changes our perspective, and all of a sudden we can back up a little bit and see what's really important. Okay? Mm -hmm. Right. Yep, and we've talked about that before. This, this is the thing. This isn't a minimizing of anything. So, man, please don't hear what I'm not saying in this. Have people offended you? Yes. Yes. Right? There's no minimizing that. Right? People have, have done things to you, I'm sure, that, that were horrible, that were traumatic. So I'm not, please don't hear me saying it's insignificant right? The only way that you can say that it's light and momentary, the only way that you can say that it isn't all that important is in light of eternity, the bigness of eternity, right? And we've talked about that several times, and this, that's, I think this, this is Paul's explanation. Why in the world do I keep doing this? Why do I keep going back? Why do I sign up for this abuse? Because I know what's in, at stake. Eternity is at stake. Eternity is in, in the balance, right? And, and what was Paul going to do? Is he going to let a little stoning stop him? <laughs> And that sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? Yes, you would let a little stoning stop you. We would, let, we would let a contrary word stop us, right? We would let a dirty look stop us, wouldn't we? Right? I don't like that person in the office. Every time they come around, they just act like they don't like me. Right? We'll let a minor seeming offense get in the way. And Paul's going, no, no, not even a stoning, not even persecuting, persecution, not even putting me in jail. That's not going to stop me. Why? Because I know what's at stake. Eternity's at stake. I can't hold on to these little offenses. I can't do it. And again, you say, well, little, is, what happened to me wasn't little. It is in light of eternity, right? Let's keep on reading. 2 Corinthians, he's going to go on and say this in, in chapter 5. It says, for Christ's love compels us. And I love that. What is Paul's motivation? And that's what I really want to get at this morning. It's not so much the how do we work this out? What do we do with people that are difficult? What do we do with people that have offended us? It's not the, the practical part of it yet. Let's talk about the motivation first. It's a love issue. What is it that compels Paul, that forces him to continue to share the gospel? What was it that, that had him get up after being stoned and, and go back into the city? What's the answer? Love, right? The love of Christ is what compelled him. All right, so we're going to look at this in a second. Well, then how did Jesus love? If, if the love of Christ is what compels us, how did Jesus love? And we'll answer that in a second. It says, For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. I love that. I love that, right? We're supposed to have this change of mind, this change of heart, where now we no longer see through worldly lenses. We see through heavenly lenses. We see through the lenses of the Holy Spirit right, where we have the mind of Christ now, we don't respond the way that the world responds. We may look at it and go, what's understandable, I understand why people that get offended um, cut people off. I understand when, when people get offended, they, they lash out against them. I get it, I understand it from a worldly perspective, but we don't live according to the pattern of the world, right? Isn't that what Paul tells us? Don't conform to the pattern of the world. We don't respond the way that other people respond, right? We're called to something different. We're called to something greater, 
right? And, and, and what is it that compels us? He's talking about this, our relationship with Christ is what changes us. Remember, remember the story um, about the, the, the king who has a guy who owes, owes him like a ton of money? Remember that story? And he calls a guy in and says, hey, it's time to, to pay what you owe. And he says, I can't. And he pleads and begs with the king. So what does the king do? Forgives the debt. This massive debt that this guy could have never paid off anyway. And the king forgives it, right? And then that guy leaves the presence of the king. And what does he do? He goes out and runs into a guy who owns him, owes him a little bit of money. And he grabs him by the throat and demands the money, right? When we have the perspective that we have been forgiven so much, right? That God has has overlooked so many trespasses, so many offenses, right? And listen, we have offended God. Every sin is an offense against God, right? We have offended God, and what does God do? He forgives us of those things, and yet we're not going to forgive other people? Man, he says, first of all, we got to understand that Christ died for me. When all of a sudden I realize that Christ laid down his life for me, how can I not lay my life down for other people, right? And that's what was so powerful about um, Romans chapter 9, when Paul said, man, I wish I could be cursed. I wish I could take their place. Is that our mentality? Is that how much we care about other people? To say, man, if only I could take their place that they may be saved. The only way that we do that is understand that Jesus took our place, right? He says, from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. Okay, you're not who you used to be. You don't respond the way that you used to be. This morning in, in the other service that I, that I preached, we talked about this. This is hard, though, right? Because even though we are new creations in Christ, we're this new, this new creation, this new creature, we still live in this fleshly body that still struggles with the, the, the sin of this world and the brokenness, right? So we still struggle with these emotions that rise up in us. But we don't give in to those. We remember who we are, right? Remember that from The Lion King? Remember that scene where Mufasa shows up and he's like, Simba, remember who you are, right? That's, I think that's what God wants us to do. This is what Paul is trying to do here. Remember who you are. That's not who you are, okay? And I, and I think we forget that, that. How many Christians have you heard say, well, that's just the way I am? Well, it should be the way you were. It shouldn't be the way you are, right? I was watching a little bit of, of The Captain, the Derek Jeter documentary. Babe, I didn't watch much of it, but when he wants to watch it with me, and I was like, nah, I don't know if I want to watch it. I didn't have it on. I had something else on. I was doing stuff around the house, and I came back in, and it was on, so I watched a couple minutes of it, right? And he was talking about this one guy, Chad Curtis, I think was the player's name, where him and Chad Curtis had this disagreement on the Yankees. If you don't know who Derek Jeter is, then we'll pray for you. But anyway, no, <laughs> but he, a baseball player, right? So he has this teammate, and the teammate disagreed with Derek Jeter and something, kind of confronted him publicly in the news and all that kind of stuff. I mean, and then Derek Jeter, they're having an interview with him, and he says, look, I, I have this, and I can't remember the adjective that he used, unique, special, something, ability to cut people off. He said, I, I've, all, I've always had it. So when somebody crosses the line or does something that I don't agree with, I just had this ability to completely cut them off. And then his sister comes on and goes, yeah, Derek's always had the ability to cut people off. And I was, first I was thinking, hold on, that's not a, it's not a special ability because a lot of us have this, right? A lot of us have this ability to be like, I'm done with you. You're dead to me, right? So you're not special, Derek. And two, that's not something to be proud of, right? Especially as Christians. But unfortunately, don't we see a lot of, a lot of Christians that, that wear it almost as a badge of honor? Well, you know, that's just how I am. Well, it should be how you were, how you are as a new creation in Christ, you don't respond the same way that the world responds, right? We don't say, well, I just cut people off. No, 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 we don't do that anymore, and we'll find out why. We're not given that option anymore. It's not who we are, but we need to be reminded of that. It's not who you are, okay? Verse 18, all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. Now, I love that. We've got to get that first. We've been reconciled to God through Christ. We have to acknowledge what Christ has done for us, or the second part is going to be impossible, right? Unless, <clears throat> unless we can go back. And remember what Jesus has done for us, that he laid down his life for us, us laying down our lives for other people, doesn't, doesn't make sense, right? So first he says, we've got to understand who we are. We have to understand we've been reconciled to God through Christ. Then here we go. Here's the big part. And gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Okay, wow. We've been given the ministry of reconciliation. We've been given a job. And what is that? To help people be reconciled to God. Is that optional? 
can we look at that and go, well, I don't really think that's in my job description. If you're a Christian, that's in your job description. You become a, a person that is a minister of reconciliation. Your job is to help people come to Jesus. What people? All people. We're not given the option to go, well, I'm only going to get these people in because they're close anyway. Right? We're not given the option to go, I don't care about those people. I'm not, I'm not going to be a minister of reconciliation to those people. We're not given that, op that option. All right? Verse 19, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Oh, right? We love that when we're talking about us, right? That God decided out of his grace and out of his love and mercy, not because I deserved it. Out of his grace, he decided, I am not going to hold your sins against you. I'm going to forgive them. <clears throat> we're supposed to be ministers of that, ambassadors of that. We take that message to people. How in the world can we take that message to people if we're going, I'm going to hold your sin against you? Anybody going to listen to that? Yeah. Anybody going to listen to that message? Yeah. Not a chance, right? And yet that's what we do as Christians. We, we, we say, I'm going to hold this person's sin against them. I'm, I'm going to cut them off. I'm going, to, I'm going to ignore them. I'm going to give them an attitude. I'm not speaking to them ever again. I'm not. We do all that kind of stuff, and then we preach reconciliation. We preach forgiveness, okay? It says, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed <clears throat> to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. We represent Christ, right? That was the, the message I gave this morning, us being conformed to the image of Christ. When people see us, they should see Christ. Amen. If we're holding people's sins against them and Jesus doesn't do that, are we representing him? Do we look like him? No, so we're failing in our job as ambassadors to, be, to look like Jesus, to make Jesus' appeal through us in our lives. It says, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be re reconciled to God. And I, and, I, and I love that. If you are not an agent of reconciliation, there may be a problem with your reconciliation with God. Does that sting? It probably should, right? Because John's going to say that in 1 John, right? He's going to say, hey, listen, if you say you love God and you don't love other people, you are a liar. You're a liar, right? Uh, Tony Evans would say it this way. Um, horizontal, uh, vertical love should have an or horizontal effect, right? If we truly have this, this vertical relationship with God, it should have an effect horizontally. If we don't see that, then there's a problem here. Does that make sense? Yeah. If there's a problem here, there's a problem here. Okay, and that's what he's saying. That's what Paul is saying. He says, well, what do we need to do? Get reconciled to God. If you're having trouble in your reconciliation with other people, get reconciled to God. <clears throat> God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's what, that's what our mission is. That's what our calling is. We wave the banner of Christianity. That's what we signed up for. Talked this morning about counting the cost. We have to understand that that's what we're called to. Okay? We can't take what we want and leave the other stuff. Doesn't work that way. Let's look at Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> it's going to get worse. <laughs> Just prepare. All right, here we go. Matthew chapter 5. Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm. <clears throat> and they linger still to this day. Yeah. And, you know, it's one-on-one -on -one forgiveness, but look at the impact it has. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yes. able to do that. Yep. And we've talked about this before. Why, why does that have such an impact? Why does that stand out so much? It's so different. It's so different. Right? Because that's, yeah, that's, that's not the way that people will respond. You know, it just isn't. It's going against the grain. It's going against the pattern of the world. And that is what people will notice. Well, they would stand up and go, hold on, there's something different about this person. Some, there's something, who, who forgives that way? Who loves that way? I mean, can you imagine looking at Paul and thinking, why in the world does this guy keep doing this? Right? Of course he would stand out. He wouldn't stand out at all if he was persecuted and he was like, I'm rolling out and I'm done with these people. Right? We're supposed to, and, and it's funny, I mean, you say that, and we're not going to read that section right now, but isn't that what he says in Matthew chapter 5? Before we get to this part of salt and light, we're to impact our community around us. Our good deeds are supposed to shine. Mm -hmm. I, I, I say this all the time. When we see good, we need to substitute God. They need to see God in what we do. All right, so Matthew 5, 38 through 48. 
You have heard that it was said, and this is, this is Jesus. He's talking to, talking to these people, giving this great sermon on the mount, right? And, and he's kind of clearing up some stuff. He says, hey, you've heard it said this, but what I'm going to tell you is this. Right? He says, you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. How many people believe that now? Eye for an eye, a tooth for, they did it to me. They said it to me. They started it. He says, man, a lot of people are going to say that. You've heard it said that. That's a common thing in our, in our society today. Well, they did it to me. I'm going to do it back, but worse, right? An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. He says, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. And we're going to talk about this more next week, practically. What does this look like? Because, man, that can be hard. What, what are we expected to do, right? And it gets worse. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them, uh, turn, to, turn, the, turn to them the other cheek also. We all heard that turn the other cheek. What does that mean? What does that look like? So we need to stay in an abusive situation, right? That's what he's teaching. Somebody's abusing you, man, you got to keep taking it. Is that what he's saying? No, it's not what he's saying. We're going to talk about that next week. What does it look like? But first, let's at least talk about the heart. Because I think he is getting to a heart that we should have in this, right? We, we should care about people so much that we're, that we're willing. We're willing to take more than the world says we should take. We're willing to go an extra mile when the world says, no way, I wouldn't go one much less go two. You know, I, w- I wouldn't take that. You're going to let them do that to you? I would not. That's not the way we respond. Uh, verse 40. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. And again, I think he's talking here about motivation, our heart for other people, that we want, we want to impact people at the end of the day. These offenses that we would take in the process are nothing compared to what we're trying to win. Right? What's at stake? It's, it just doesn't compare. Verse 41. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Mm, we good with that? We good with that? Love your enemies. What does the word love mean? To prefer. Right? It wants to hear that every time we see the word love in the scriptures. He says, love your enemies, prefer your enemies, which means what? I elevate them above myself. So my, my offense that I want to hold against them, I go, no, 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 I'm not going to hold on to that. Why? Because I want, I, I want to impact them. I want to see them come into a relationship with the Lord, right? So we have to pray for them. I mean, that, that is so countercultural, right? I mean, the culture would say, man, somebody, somebody hurts you. Your enemy comes against you, mm, you pray that you can get them back. That's not what it says. Love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? I love that. Are not even the tax collectors doing that? We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be different. How is it any different to love people that are lovable? Everybody does that, right? You don't need any divine intervention to love people that are lovable, but to love people that come against you, to love people that persecute you, that takes a different kind of love, right? That takes a different kind of power, a different kind of strength. That comes from God, okay? Verse 47, and if you greet only your own people, and and I love that, greet only your own people. What's he talking about with your own people? The people that you like, the people that you enjoy, the people that are like you. Right? If that's all you're going to do, you're not going to stand out. You're not going to be showing the love of Christ to people. Right? We're not going to be a light. We're going to look like everybody else. Even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your Father, Heavenly Father is perfect. 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. I love this. Paul says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Okay, so what is the example? What are we talking about today? What's the example that Paul has left? We have a concern for people and their eternity for their souls that goes past any kind of offense that we could take from them, right? That's the example of Christ. What does Jesus pray as they're nailing him to the cross? Father, get them back. Pay them back, Lord. Right? Is that what he says? Right? Make them suffer. Make them feel what I felt. That's not what he prays. Forgive them. Don't hold this against them, Lord. That's the example of Christ. Paul, why in the world would Paul pray, Lord, please forgive them? 
Why would he share the gospel with these people who have done so much against him? Why in the world wouldn't he say, get what you deserve? Because he loves them and wants to see them in heaven. He has a concern for their eternity, right? We're to do the same thing. This is Paul's command to us. He implores us in 2 Timothy 2, 3 and 10. He says, join with me in suffering. That's a big invitation, isn't it? Join with me in suffering. That's not, that's not the typical way to recruit people to church, is it? How many people say, man, you ought to come to my church. We suffer there, <laughs> right? That, that doesn't go over as well. And yet, that is the call. As a Christian, suffering is part of the deal. I'm called to suffer the slings and arrows that other people are going to send my way. I'm called to carry the offense. I'm called to forgive, right? I'm called to shoulder the burdens. That's part of what we're called to do is to suffer. So Paul says, man, join me in that. Are we willing to? As Christians, that's what we're called to. Why? Because that's what Christ did. If we want to be a follower of Jesus, we need to do what Jesus did. Again, we talked about this a couple weeks ago. We can't, we can't be followers of Christ who refuse to follow Christ. It doesn't work, right? So he says, join with, with me in suffering. Like a good soldier in Christ, in Christ Jesus. I love that. Then verse 10, therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect. I love it. Who are the elect? The chosen people of God. Why does Paul go through all of this? For them. To see people get saved. That they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with the eternal glory. There it is. Bottom line. Why does he do it? That they may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus, the eternal glory. So I want to just close with this. Again, who are the people that you've cut off? Who are the people that you have distanced yourself from? That you have said, and and we're not talking about boundaries. There are appropriate boundaries that we will talk about next week. But I'm talking about emotionally. Emotionally, who have you cut off? Who have you said, nope, I'm done with them. I don't care what happens to them. I'm just done. Who is it? We got to be like Jesus. We got to be like Paul. We got to have a concern even for those people. Again, it would have been easy for Paul to go, I'm done with the Jews, I'll move on to the Gentiles. But he didn't, because he knew that eternity was at stake through that lens with the people that have offended us. Right? We need to. We have to. Forgiveness is not optional. Right? And I think, it, I think it's even more than that, because I think forgiveness is one side of the coin. I think the forgiveness is the reaction. But we're called to be proactive. We're not called just simply to say, oh, well, they've offended me, so I'm going to let it go. No, 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 we go after them. We're proactive. Maybe at this point it's just in our prayers. But where is your focus? Do you want to see people saved, even people that have offended you, that have done you wrong? Right? Who is it that you need to be reconciled with? Who is it that you need to, to be praying for that they are reconciled to God? I think we all have people. And again, sometimes it's, it's through offense. Sometimes it's because of persecution, those kinds of things. But sometimes it's even more subtle than that. Sometimes it's just people that we look at and go, it's hopeless. They're never going to change. Right? That, that so diminishes the power of God. Is there, is there a single person who's beyond the reach of God? Nobody, right? Nobody. So when we write those people off and say, man, they're, they're never going to change. They're always going to be the same. There's no point even talking to them. We are not being like Jesus. We're not being like Paul, right? Who are those people that the Lord's bringing to your mind right now that you have got to start praying for, that you have got to start trying to reconnect with, that you have got to start caring about once again? Who is it that you need to forgive and be praying for? Let's pray. Lord, I know this is, this is an incredibly, incredibly difficult message because there is no question in my mind that there are people in this room right now who have been hurt, legitimately hurt by other people. They have been abused. They have been mistreated. They have been taken advantage of. And they would have every reason from a worldly perspective to write that person off to say, I'm done with them, I'm washing my hands of them, I don't care what happens to them. From a worldly perspective, they would have every reason to do that, and it would be so understandable. And yet you've called us to more. You've called us to be different. You've called us to do what naturally we cannot do, which is to forgive offense and to wish good for people, to wish you for people. So I pray that this very moment, the people that maybe can feel the the anxiety rise just thinking about that person who maybe feel there are defensive defenses going up at just the thought of reconciliation with that person. I just want to pray for them that 
you would soften their heart, that you would soften their mind, that you would, it would open their eyes to the big picture that eternity is a long time. It is a long time to be without you, that they would see through that perspective and desire to see every single person in their life be reconciled to you. And I know, again, Lord, this is so, this is so challenging because the last thing in the world that you want to do is wish blessing on people that have hurt you, but that's what you've called us to. That's what you did. When you're praying that prayer, forgive them as people are nailing you to the cross. That's an example for us. I'm sure that wasn't easy for you, Lord. I'm sure that, that man, that the temptation was there. I love the fact that the scriptures say Jesus was tempted in every way that we were, yet sin not. I'm sure he had a temptation there to, to cut people off, to look at people and say, man, I've done so much for you, and yet you reject me. But he didn't. Why? Out of love, out of compassion, out of concern, out of, out of having an eternal perspective. So I, I just pray that you would instill us with those same things, that you would give us a, maybe a fresh heart towards people and maybe fresh eyes to see them uh, from a different vantage point. So, again, Lord, just be with each and every one of us. Soften our hearts. Give us the, the, the will to say, I may not want to do this, but I know I, I, I have to, I need to, to extend forgiveness to, to people that, that have hurt us. So, again, Lord, just uh, I love you for this. I love you for the fact that you've done this to me, that I've given you every reason to write me off time and time and time again with my failures, and yet you haven't. So, uh, thank you for that. Help me to, to live that out. So, I love you and thank you and pray these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yeah. Hmm. Yeah.